Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much indeed for the invitation to be uh, be with you. And it is a joy once again. Um, it is a bit misconcerting to be here and Norman not being here. Uh, and I had a great relationship with uh, Norman, uh, but um, it's good to uh, continue uh, the link um, as well uh, with uh, the church. Uh, yes, um, and just a, a bit of news for those who knew the society uh, and also uh, knew my predecessor, uh, who was David Knox. Uh, his wife, May, uh, was called home on Sunday afternoon and the funeral's tomorrow. Um, so uh, if you can remember uh, the family uh, in your prayers. I'm going to read just a, a few verses uh, that we've used uh, in uh, setting up or changing the name um, of the society. And it's Matthew chapter 25. Uh, Matthew chapter 25. And we're breaking into the chapter at verse 42 uh, and reading to verse 45. And these verses actually sum up um, the whole work um, uh, that we have uh, within uh, the society. Of course, this is the Lord speaking, and it's part of the Olivet Discourse. And he says, For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. You gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. When I was a stranger, and ye took me not in, naked, and ye clothed me not, sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they say, also answering him, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, or our thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it, not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And one of the reasons why we have changed our name from Sea Men's Christian Friends Society to Sea Fur's Christian Friends Society is quite simply that there's more and more females now being involved on shipping. Not only within our cruise ships, but now also within our merchant navy. So any of the containers, the uh, grain tankers that come in, particularly from uh, European companies, we will have uh, female cadets uh, on board. They could be deck cadets. They could be officer cadets. We also have uh, female engineering cadets all coming in. Um, and, and so we're now seeing uh, that the whole shipping uh, industry I is now changing. Would you believe that our Royal Navy now have at least two commanders in charge of warships? They also have an admiral who is now female. Uh, you can go on a cruise ship and your captain and all your officers are all female. Uh, so it's amazing. And, and so when at the end of uh, June we changed the name, but we decided uh, how do we change from seamen to seafarers? And when you talk to crew, they will actually turn around and say, that they are sea furs, they're not sea men or sea women. Uh, and so the new trustees felt, well then, if this is a term uh, that they use and a term that then will mean that the females will feel more inclusive, uh, even in our own ministry, well then, after 177 years, we will change our name to be more open and more inclusive of our females uh, on board. There's a big drive at the moment with all organizations who have centers. What facilities do you have? 
for females? Do you supply female clothing? Do you supply female toiletries as well as male toiletries? Do you have facilities, changing facilities in your centre for me females? And, and so this is a worldwide thing. It's not just uh, within the UK. It's a worldwide thing. And, of course, when the society was formed in 1846, it was unheard of for a, a lady to be uh, at sea. Um, so uh, we haven't become politically correct. We haven't been hit by the woke generation. Uh, just with the industry uh, changing, we felt that as a society we should move and be inclusive um, of that. So on the table outside, you'll see a pack like this. Please lift it. It is thick. You have three pieces of information inside. You have my prayer letter, then one from um, head office, but there's also a leaflet in there talking a wee bit more about why uh, we've made uh, the changes. I have to be careful of what I say and what I do because Billy and Iris is here. <laughs> Let's just say they've known me since I was knee-high to a grasshopper. Okay? Um, so uh, that shows you. I'll not say hi long ago. Okay? <laughs> Aris, I know you, we tell. I was actually trying to save you from being embarrassed at how long you know me. Okay? Okay? I'm 61. Okay? And they know me from when I was pulled, pushed in a trans, a, 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 a transad, uh, or a pram uh, down to the uh, the meetings. So that's how long, okay. Now they don't look as if they know me sixty odd years ago, but I ever. <laughs> Sorry. They were children as well, right? They were children. Yes, teenagers. Yes, they were teenagers. Yes, yeah. So you can see why uh, we have, have, have changed. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to, to see. In fact, I'll, I'll maybe come across so that everybody can see. Every colour dot that you see on that screen is a different type of ship that is transversing our oceans uh, and bringing goods. 95% of world trade is done by sea. My in Northern Ireland, we haven't heard the little word protocol. Sure we haven't. <laughs> but I wonder, do you realise that there's 1.9 million men and women working upon our high seas today? That's the whole population of Northern Ireland from the last census. That in 20 ports worldwide, Seafarers Christian Friends Society, or SEFS, is trying to catch the whole population of Northern Ireland. So what an opportunity we have to meet men and women from all around the world and particularly from countries where it is closed to the gospel. Uh, and it's amazing how they have that opportunity. There's the same just zoomed in to uh, our, our own waters so that you can see. Now, I'm not advocating for any political party, but I just want you to see just how busy our waters are and how important the talks regarding the protocol are in getting it right. I'm not saying that every ship coming up the REC on around the English Channel is coming to Northern Ireland or to Belfast, but it just shows you how busy our waters are. Um, and that was taken on a Thursday at one particular point. And that's how busy we are per day. Um, so we are. But one of the things um, at co during COVID, do um, you remember those two years uh, when we weren't allowed to do anything? Um, I wasn't allowed to go and visit ships. Um, Mr. McBride decided that he would like to be my friend and wrote to me personally uh, and said, Sam, you can't go out your door. You're now one of our clinically vulnerable people. Um, so um, I wasn't allowed to, uh, to do it. But as we've come out of COVID, 
one of the things is that we as a society are now seeing a, a large amount of people coming to us and asking could they work as a volunteer or we're having new ports coming and asking is there any opportunity of having a chaplain within our particular port uh, and so in Northern Ireland we now have uh, three uh, volunteers because when I came into the organization I, my main port was Belfast but I also had a responsibility for Larne, for Warren Point and for Lisnahalli or as it's known now foil ports up in Londonderry, Derry, Dory, Stroke City. <laughs> have I got them all? Um, it's funny how you have to keep everybody happy. Um, but, of course, that's that's Ulster, isn't it? Um, that's just us. So, Andy, that you see on the far side, um, he is in Warren Point. He's from Annalong, and he is a street chaplain. Um, so, if you're in Newcastle on a Friday, Saturday night, you'll probably see Andy and his team um, outside the charity shop, uh, the Elam charity shop on the main street, um, uh, with their tea, coffee, biscuits, flip flops. Um, so they have, uh, and so he was. He's also the chaplain to Warren Point Football Club. Um, so uh, he does a couple of days. Uh, for us. Do pray for him because they've put a restriction uh, in uh, Warren Point that no chaplain uh, uh, is not allowed to walk on his own around the port during operational hours. So either Andy has to do his visits between 1 and 2 or then he has to wait to 7 o'clock and do them at 7 o'clock because if he goes in any other time, he has to be taken down by a member of the security at the security gate. And sometimes you maybe just say hello um, because everybody's busy to whoever's on uh, duty watch. And then he has to phone the gate and say, can you come and pick me up? Because he can't even walk to the next ship uh, without the security of, uh, guys being there. Um, so... Do pray because he's going to try and uh, see if he can change things around so that he can uh, see uh, folks a, a bit better. The couple in the middle uh, is a Baptist pastor in Londonderry. That's all the road back um, in uh, Rich Hill uh, Park, uh, Baptist Church in Londonderry, and his wife Fowl. And they're looking after things for us in foil ports. And in fact, I think it was yesterday or uh, the day before, uh, or maybe the oh, yeah yesterday, I think it was, he sent me photographs to show uh, that they were down on the harbour um, and um, fishing uh, ships. So they are thankful that they were able to do that. The, this guy here is Ian Saunders. Uh, and Ian is at the Irish Baptist College. He came and did his basement with me, and he's doing his master's at the moment. So this week he's been doing essay writing, um, so he has. And um, he works in uh, our office, and then if I'm off sick or on holiday or whatever, uh, Ian looks after the port for us uh, in Belfast. Or if I'm going up to see down to see Andy or up to see um, uh, Ollie, then Ian will cover uh, the port. But it's amazing, as I say, that to see things expand. The young couple that you see on the far side with the children, they live in Lisbon in Portugal. And we're trying to get them in. Now, if a cruise ship or if a, a, an ordinary uh, merchant ship actually contacts them and says, can you come? The harbour will allow them. But the harbour will not give them authority to do it on a, on a regular basis. We don't know why, um, but we're trying to get that in 
they made the, made the excuse that everybody was working from home because of COVID, uh, then they're back in again. And the thing is, the guy worked in the port. It's not to say that he's not known. He worked in the port, um, uh, but we just don't know why uh, they're putting up these uh, obstacles. But do, do pray for uh, John and Ruth, or John and Ruth, uh, as they... Uh, she's the financial director for the Bible Society in Lisbon, in Portugal. Uh, so do pray for them. The gentleman in the blue t- uh, blue jumper is Peter Wales, and Peter has a great team with him. Peter lives in the Isle of Wight, and he does Southampton, Portsmouth, Plymouth, uh, all around the Solent area, uh, and so he has now got a big team uh, with him there, and. Um, we're also, uh, we have um, a trustee uh, in England and um, he is actually trying to get more ports open even in Scotland uh, because we uh, had a guy in Greenock uh, and he left. So we're now trying to get someone in Greenock. We're trying to look into Aberdeen. We're trying to see if we can get back into uh, Southampton again. Um, so... Um, there's a, a big movement. The gentleman over here um, is a guy called Alexander, so that's why he's standing underneath a ship with his name. Uh, but he worked for another organization. And the organization moved away from their basis of belief and their foundation. And they brought in new management. And there's quite a number of folks who have then come to us uh, because they've moved away from their evangelical stance. And uh, Alexander was one of these. And while he was doing, he's working in the port of um, Ghent uh, in the Netherlands. We have a couple who are in Slovenia, uh, in a port in Slovenia. Uh, and so we're seeing this happening time and time again. Uh, and, and so just uh, do pray. Uh, we have a new board of trustees and uh, do, uh, we have a, a, a gentleman uh, who's running the office and do pray uh, for them as they get everything. Northern Ireland is known for making up names for jobs. Okay. Now, Colin D, as we call him, Colin Dickinson, who would in a sense be our CEO but his official title is Change Management Executive. <laughs> so he's responsible for looking after the whole change, the logo, the name, uh, getting everything all done. So anything that's passed down from the trustees, Ian's respons- or Colin's responsible for getting out practically. Um, so um, I don't know where they thought that one up, uh, Change Management. So that's a new one. But what an opportunity we have right across the world. This is my wife Pauline and I on board this wee uh, ship uh, called the Maud from Hertha Guden. Uh, so she's a Norwegian uh, ship. She will do um, the Northern Lights and she will do all the uh, up around Iceland, Greenland, uh, around the ice uh, uh, waters, so she will. But we had a guy came, uh, and you can see uh, along the front here, magnets, um, and he came. And once you saw him coming to you, you knew that this, this gentleman lived an alternative lifestyle. And he looked, and he saw one of these magnets, and he said to my wife, I was talking to someone, and I overheard him saying, Ma'am, can I have this magnet because it has my favourite Bible verse on it? And she says, yes, because it's free. She says, but what's your favourite Bible verse? And he quoted the Bible. She turned, he turned the, the magnet over. And it was Romans 3, or Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Then he spotted a book by... Dr. David Jeremiah on overcoming loneliness. And he said, Ma'am, can I also have this book? 
And so Pauline says to him, why do you feel lonely? And he says, yes, because of my lifestyle, and I am the nighttime receptionist, so I have the, <laughs> the longest uh, time to work, because everyone's asleep, so I'm there just in case someone uh, needs or rings through to the reception. He says, so I would like. So I was able then to turn away. I have just finished. And I turned and I said to him, do you know something? He says, what? I says, You're not, you will still feel lonely at times, but you can have someone who sticks closer than a brother. He says, what do you mean? I says, well, if you answer the knocking upon your heart's door, as Revelation 3.20 is saying, and read this book, you'll find that Jesus Christ will be your friend. He will come in and he will sup with you. He turned and he looked at us and he says, I cannot wait to start my duty tonight. Do I start reading this book to find more about this? And so we're continuing to pray that that young man will actually see and read that book and learn that he can still be lonely in a crowd. And how often do you and I feel that? At times, even on a Sunday in church, that we have this crowd of people that we are, but we still have this loneliness, but we have the Lord Jesus with us. We are so thankful to uh, groups that help us. And this year, um, the good news for everyone, formerly the Gideons, uh, have given us 200 Bibles uh, to give. And it's amazing. Um, so it was. Um, I was saying to Gerald Thompson uh, that um, uh, they look at it and they'll say, Pastor, can we have one of these? And I say, yes, you can have one. And they say, hold on a minute, this looks familiar. I said, what do you mean? Is this the Bible that you see in the hotels? And I said, yes. Uh, and they're allowing me to have this? And, and I said, yes. You can have it. It's yours. And, and, and the, it's just amazing to see the reaction. We had a church from um, Lurgan. Uh, and they had revised standard version Bibles that they weren't using anymore. And 20 of them went on Sunday to a Christian Bible fellowship on the Queen Victoria, Cunard. Okay? Um, so, uh, and it, they were just totally blown away that there was a church willing to give their Bibles to them to use so that they can have uh, all the same um, uh, for, for people. The Azamara Pursuit is one that I really love going on board. And I, I, in fact, I'll be on board her, uh, like the Azamara Journey, her sistership, um, on um, Thursday. But I had a, an aunt who, who had died. Um, Billy and Aris will probably... Uh, know or remember my dad's sister um, Alice um, she died uh, and the funeral was the morning that they were coming in um, so I contacted them and I said because they were staying in overnight I said do you mind if I have it come later on they said no that's okay uh, and I went and a guy came he was a pianist, he's from the States. And he came and he said to me, um, he says, who are you and, and what's this? And we started to explain who we were. He says, now it's falling into place. I says, what do you mean? He says, normally at this time, I have a middle uh, show to play, but it was cancelled. He says, I decided I would go and have something to eat. And I always eat in the officer's mess. But for some particular reason, I felt compelled to come to the cruise mess. And we sat. We had our 
dinner evening meal together, and we sat and we encouraged each other in the Lord and looking forward to the Lord's return. And he said this as he left. He says, Pastor Sam, you may not under believe this. He says, but for the first time tonight, I now know the meaning of divine appointments. Because I had to be here to see you. And God had directed. I think he was about 25 years on board cruise ships. And that was the first time in 25 years that his show, middle show, had been cancelled. And he couldn't work us out. And then that's what had happened. The same with the uh, other uh, cruise ship, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the Viking. And I'm, I'm thinking of a young girl uh, who uh, came uh, to me. And she wanted to know, um, was I um, a missionary as well as a pastor? And I said, yes. And she says, whispered to me, I wish I was a missionary. I says, who told you you weren't a missionary? She says, my church. And she's coming from Zimbabwe. I says, what do you mean, your church? My church says that if I don't leave my mom, my dad, my family, my country, if I don't give up my job and I leave the, uh, don't leave the country and follow the Lord, then I cannot be a missionary unless I'm outside. I says, hold on. What's your contract? Six months. I says, right, let's take the principle that your church is talking about. So for six months, you've left your family. You've left your country. You're on board a ship with 300 of a crew from 40 different nations. You're away from home for six months of the year. Do you not think God has placed you here to be a missionary? And that girl started to cry. And she says, Pastor, this is just totally blowing my mind. I, I'm hoping the ship will come back again because I have a book for her uh, to explain. But I came home and I th- sat down and I thought, where was this teaching coming from? And I had to explain to her that there are certain areas today, countries, where Christians have to go in as a doctor, as a teacher, as an electrician, as a lecturer, uh, and in employment, they can't just put down that they're a missionary because they wouldn't get their visa. And she says, what? I says, yes. So do you not think you are a missionary in God's eyes? And she just could not accept this. That was amazing. One of the cruise ships um, contacted me and said, um, the leader of the fellowship says, Sam, um, I'm having a wee bit of problem. I says, what's wrong? He says, "Um, I have people who are on board ships, on board the ship with us, and they won't meet with us on a Sunday because they say that it's not church. Church has to be when they go home. So for six months or nine months, they're having no Christian fellowship. Can you do a study or a series of studies on why we meet together and the importance of meeting together? And so um, just on Monday or yesterday, um, I sent them um, the fifth uh, Bible study Um, looking at the aspect of even in a small group like that, they can have the Lord's table. They can have baptism. And the importance of meeting together, even as a small group. Uh, And so this is the the fellowship doing it. And uh, and it's amazing uh, that they're, they're doing this. And we also have two uh, 
Filipinos um, who I'm doing uh, contact with. Uh, and this is all stemming from COVID uh, and the whole aspect of it. We're asked on occasions for Bibles. The guy in the orange boiler suit asked me for uh, a Tagalog Bible or, uh, for the Philippines. I gave it to him. And um, I left. And later that evening, I got a message from him saying, Sam, when we come back, can you bring me another Bible? I says, why, what's wrong? He says, some of the crew members stole my Bible. <laughs> when he went to get the Bible, it was away. <laughs> so I took, him, I took him another one. Uh, but his captain also asked for a Bible as well. Um, and it was amazing. The two ladies that you see are from Zimbabwe. And they were so excited at getting the Bible. They were the fourth, uh, the second group of two who came and said to me, Pastor, thank you for bringing a Bible because I can now say this is the first Bible I can call my own. Complete Bible. And you can see that the one that has the jacket on, she was an avid reader. And she saw people that she knew, authors that she knew. I'd won by the late Dr. Charles Stanley. And she started talking to her friend. And she just looked at the table. And I had to stop her with what she had there. Because she would have cleared the whole table. <laughs> of all the books. <laughs> so, and then she says to me, I hope we come back and I get, get, get to work. Uh, but what a tremendous opportunity. I was speaking today to uh, a man, and on his badge it said the Russian Federation. He was actually from Belarus. And he asked me, did I have a Russian Bible? And I had our daily bread, uh, reading notes in Russia, in Russian, and I gave it to him. And he was so pleased to be able to get these, to read them. It was amazing just how people are wanting to read the Word of God uh, and wanting to be informed. Some will come and say to me, Pastor, why does my government ban this book? What's in it? Can I have this to read to find out why? <laughs> the, the government won't allow this book in, the, in my country. Uh, and so because they're outside uh, and they have the freedom then uh, to do it. We were up at uh, Keswick Port Stewart um, over the 12th week. Uh, and so this was the first opportunity where we had uh, the new pop-up banner. And um, I got told off for having the old logo uh, by uh, our office uh, showing and the PR um, lady turned around and said, what are I giving off about? You're in the middle of a transaction, transition. So people will still know you as by the old logo, uh, but I'll give you an opportunity to talk about the new logo. Uh, so don't worry about it. Uh, so uh, we had a great opportunity. But what a wonderful opportunity uh, to meet people from around the world to share with them, to have them sit and talk and ask you to pray for the birth of a child, for a son, a daughter, or a mother, or a wife who's in hospital and facing major surgery. I have one guy, he's now working in Portugal, in a hotel in Portugal, and for five years he and his wife have been trying for a child. And he asked me to pray because he was going home to start IVF. The first course took, but around 20 weeks she lost it. He's from India. The pediatrician turned around and told her that was her destiny. I says to him, well, what did you do? He says, nothing. I says, I'll tell you something. The pediatrician had said that to my wife. 
that had been on the floor, whether there was zero tolerance or not. And he says, I felt like it. And so when the second course was being done, he phoned and he telephoned, or he, he, he sent me messages to say they were going to the hospital, and we prayed and we prayed. 24 weeks came and gone, full term came, and little Nora was brought into this world. And he turned around and he said to me, Pastor, I need to know, Catholic background, he says, I need to know more about this God who answers prayer. I'm sitting in getting ready to interview Andy. Uh, I'd been down early and my mobile went in the car and it was Rohinden um, to say, ask me to pray for his brother. And I, he says, why? He says, my brother's going into for surgery. He's the only one that is working in the family, so he needs to get back again. I says, that's okay. I have a meeting. He says, no, I want you to pray now. And so he moved the phone out, and there was the brother standing beside him. So while he was in India, and I'm in the car park at Warren Point, we just bowed our heads and prayed. And as soon as his brother came out of the anesthetic, he turned around and he said to his brother, didn't I tell you God answers prayer? He says, you and I need to know more. And we need to pray more to God. Uh, and so these are the things that had happened. And you see, we feel that we are going to serve through our passage, Matthew chapter 25, that we will be serving seafarers with compassion. And we're taking the, fulfilling even Matthew 28 in taking the good news to the nations of the world. So we are. Thank you.